Hi, how's it going? Jasper from Limo Coast here. Welcome to part two of our free crash course where we create a chat with PDF or website type of app with Flutterflow, Flowwise, Superbase, and OpenAI. In this part, this is where our Flutterflow chat flows are actually gonna connect with Flutterflow front end and they're going to work together to create that interaction where the user can upload their documents or their website URL into a knowledge base and then chat with that knowledge base to get a very accurate response from our AI chatbot. So in this part, we'll first cover how to set up your API calls on Flutterflow and we'll cover how the front end interface is put together, how the database is designed, how the action chains are implemented and as well as how everything worked together. So let's set up our API calls first. We want to create an API call group here and name it Flowwise. And the API base URL here should be your Flowwise domain slash API slash V1 slash prediction, something like that. If you're unsure, go to any one of your chat flows and click on the API endpoint button here from the top right corner. Click on the curl tab and your base URL should be the first portion of this URL just right before that long and random looking string text. Those are called the endpoints, which we'll be using that part next. So we wanna paste that base URL into our API base URL here, and we can click save. We are creating a group here because we have three different chat flows, right? But they all share the same base URL. Uh, do not use the exact same URL as mine here, Just go to your own Flowwise endpoint and then get your base URL because this is just an example I inputted for this course. And if you purchase the template, yeah, don't forget to change that part. Now, let's create our first post API call for the PDF upsert chat flow. Let's create a new API call, name it PDF upsert. The method type is post and for the API endpoint, you can locate it from your Flowwise PDF upsert chat flow. Go to API endpoint, this pop-up from the top right corner, go to curl tab, and the random looking string of text is your endpoint for this particular chat flow. And each chat flow share the same base URL, but different endpoints. And we can add a new header, copy and paste this part, content type, multi-part form data, and let's move on to the body tab and select multi-part here. Now let's set up our variables. So we have files, which is an uploader file type, and it's not a list. We have question, it's a string, and it's false. And the default value is what is this document about? And we have the metadata, which is a string. So you might be asking, uh, metadata based on here, like if you go to the curl tab, if you check that, you can see more configurations that you can send. You might, if you have worked with Flowwise before, you might be asking, okay, metadata is supposed to be a JSON type. That is true, but the reason why we're doing a string is because as of right now, Flutterflow doesn't have a way to pass a JSON type uh, from, the act, from the action. So we are actually using a string type here, but our content is gonna be a text combination where we, we recreate a JSON format. So if you have worked with like Bubble before with Flowwise, you might be asking why we're not using a JSON type here. It's because of a technical constraint that's currently on Flutterflow side. Uh, this is just a workaround, but it also works. So that's why, if you're asking. If you haven't integrated Flowwise with any no-code tools, uh, you, you're probably not even gonna catch uh, this part. So you can just move on, don't worry about that. And in step three, let's come back to the body type and then add our parameters in. So they're basically gonna be the same. So files, question, metadata. So the value source are all from variable and we just select the variable that we have set up on the variables tab here. So what this part is handling is basically we're gonna send these body, these parameters with this API call, but the values for each of the parameter is actually dynamic. So that's why we wanna use uh, select variable here. So when we set up the actions later on, we are actually gonna pass some information, pass the variables in here. So to dynamically send different things to that Flowwise API endpoint. That's why this body is set up this way. And we can click save here. And this is it. You can also test it. Like you can go to this tab, 
usually you can test your API call, but because we're sending an entire file in here, so we can't really test it here, or I haven't figured out a way to test it here. You kind of have to test it in test mode or run mode or actually publish that to the to a domain to test it, this part, test this API call. But if you follow the setup exactly, it will work, I promise, because, because I have already made a working app with this exact setup. Now let's move on. Let's create our next API call for the web upsert chat flow. So we want to have a, we want to name this API call web upsert. And for the method type is post and the API endpoint, we were, we we're going to get that from Flowwise. And you can locate that endpoint from your web upsert chat flow. And for headers here, we want to paste copy and paste this part. So we want to copy and paste the content type application slash JSON. So the body type here is actually a, a JSON type here, unlike the PDF uh, API call, because PDF, we need to send a file through that API call. But for the web absurd, everything will, uh, is actually a string. So we just, we can simply use the JSON type and we can move on to body and select JSON type here. We always, want to pass the parameters as variables. So we always want to set up our variables first and then we can put them into the body here. So let's move on to the variables type. We have question and the type is string. It's not a list. We have URL. This this is where the user is going to provide a URL. Then we'll ask the, uh, the chat flow to scrape and then upset the content into our knowledge base. The type is string. And we also have another string type variable called namespace. And this is basically the part of the metadata that we're going to send as a way to filter, to label uh, our, our embeddings on in our vector database. So when we later query them, we can use this namespace to search for only the relevant embeddings. If you work with Pinecone before, you already know namespace is actually a feature that's offered by Pinecone, but it is a pay feature. So I think it costs like 70 bucks to use, but with this same setup, you can achieve the same result, but for free. Uh, and that's why I named this variable namespace, just so that uh, semantically they mean the same thing and because they are used to achieve the same functionality. Okay, now let's head back to JSON, our body here. And we wanna have a JSON here. And we first, we're gonna have override config. And, and as part of over, override config, we have URL, which we can then drag our URL variable here. As you can see, it's just properly set up there. And we have the metadata here. And as you can see, namespace, we can just drag that namespace in here. So the re and the reason why for the PDF officer part, we have metadata as the variable, but here we have namespace is because here we already have control over how the metadata part is structured. But with PDF, since it is a workaround, so we need to construct the entire metadata. So entire these JSON body as a, as a string, right? But that's why the variables are set up a bit differently because we are working around some flutter flows constraint. And for questions, we have a question here and we can save here. And for this API call, we can actually test it. You can test it here. You can input your URL. You can put a namespace there and you can put a question here. I will use my setup here and then I'll show you. So you can put your URL, let's say no more codes. And you can put namespace. And you can put questions like summarize these and then we can test it and see you have a response here. And then on the super base side, actually, I will show you you have, yeah, yeah, you have more embeddings now in the Superbase database. Yep. And then you can see that uh, they are, they're into different chunks. And if we click on metadata here, you can see that there is a, there is a parameter. There is a field called namespace here and then namespace, it's just the namespace I randomly input it here. So this API call also works but you don't have to test it if you follow the exact same structure uh, because I've already tested that for you. So you, you just need to make sure the setup is exactly the same. Okay, now our upset part is done. Let's make, an, let's make our third API call, which is gonna be used to ask questions, retrieve information and receive a response back. Again, pretty similar to what we have done in the previous two API calls. 
uh, the, the method type is post. The endpoint, we can find it from Flowwise. Header is the same as the web abstract one. It's content type application JSON. And our body, again, is corresponding to the header we just used is JSON. And as you can see, we before we actually configure the body, we want to configure our variables here. And what we're going to do is question string. And we're going to add another variable, which is namespace string. So this namespace here is very important. We need to use that. Uh, we always need to make sure we pass the namespace when we ask question, because otherwise, just imagine you have multiple documents or URLs scraped and then inserted into your knowledge base. If you don't have a way to retrieve specific and uh, retrieve information from specific document or websites, what, what's going to happen is if you ask chatbot to summarize it, they're going to summarize all the knowledge, all the information in your knowledge base, but it's, it's just going to be a mix of all the documents and websites you have upserted in there. So it's, it's not going to be an accurate response. It's because you haven't specified which embeddings you want to search for and then formulate your responses based on the information that you asked for. So namespace here is as a way to filter through information. So you always need to have that here. And for question here, unlike the previous two calls, which they didn't really matter before. This question is that your user is going to define what the question is. So this variable is actually going to be uh, based on users uh, input on the front end. And let's go back to the body tab. And it, a bit similar to the upser here, but instead of metadata, we're actually using super base metadata filter here as part of the JSON structure and the namespace is going to be inputted here and question is going to be inputted. It's going to be set up here as well. And you can click save. There you have it. This is all the API calls that we need to set up. And now let's move on to the front end. Okay. Now let's quickly talk about the user flow and pages. So we're going to have a login page, self-explanatory. So we're going to have a pretty standard login and sign up page after the user login or sign up, they're going to be here at a home page. So they can select if they want to chat with the PDF or they want to chat with the website or they want to see their previous chat sessions here. So for the, we have two officer pages, right? One is to upload PDF and one is to ask a web page, which is also essentially upsetting information from this web page. So for upload PDF page, the user will have a button to upload a PDF locally, and they have a widget to preview that PDF that just, they just uploaded. They have a text input field to give it a name, and they finally can upset the file through our PDF upset call from this action button from this button here. And we're going to attach an action chain on this button to actually do the API call. And for the ask web page site for the ask web. So for the upsert web page, we have a input, we have an input for the website URL, and then we have a button to make the API call. And we're going to attach an action chain later here to actually make that call. And we have a chat page. This basically, uh, every time a user upsert a PDF document or a website, after they successfully have upsert, after they successfully upsert information into it, the knowledge base, we're gonna redirect them into this chat page and they can start asking questions with our universal query API. And we also have a previous chat page where a user can ask questions about PDFs or websites that previously they have already up, upserted. So they do not need to add more into the super base before they can ask any questions. They can already resume the previous conversation. And we have a pretty standard user profile page to edit the information um, to or to upgrade or to lock out. So based on the user flow, our database design is as follow. So for user collection, it's pretty standard. You can just simply use the Flutterflow template and we have a chat sessions collection. So here, uh, this collection is to create chat sessions that user can come back to after they have su successfully upserted PDFs or, or websites into the knowledge base. This saves users from having to upsert again and if they wanna ask more questions. The most important fields are length user, 
this is to control access. We don't want all your users on your app to see each other's document sessions, right? They, 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 they shouldn't be able to ask questions about other people's uh, documents. And you have a query underscore namespace. This is the filter. This is the filter used when querying for information. As you can see, uh, without the right query namespace, uh, the other users can't have no way to retrieve information from the other documents. They have absurded date. This is for sorting purposes. We can sort users' chat sessions with this absurded date uh, field. So yeah, we have this chat sessions collection. And for flow-wise message collection, this is to remember what questions are asked and responses are generated during a chat session. I named it Flowwise Message because message is already is already in use for my, some of my other apps uh, because I'm using actually the same Firebase for that. Uh, you can simply name it message if you don't have other uh, collection that's called the same name. The most important fields are linked user, so it's to control access, and you have linked session. This is to control what messages to appear. Uh, for each chat sessions because you don't want the message to flood into all the sessions, right? It doesn't make sense. So we want a way to um, control what to be displayed in different chat sessions. And we have its user. This is a Boolean to identify if this is a question sent by the user or a response uh, from Flowwise. Okay, now let's go to our PDF upstart page. Let's talk about how we can use action from the Flutter for front end and actually successfully upsert a PDF document. So step one, let's set up our upload PDF, PDF page where you have a button to trigger an action to upload the PDF file. We have a text field to name the PDF. It has two use cases for these text fields. In my design, we can use these as a way to label the chat sessions. But combining that with users ID, we can as we can use these as the query uh, namespace to filter um, to make sure when we chat with our knowledge base, we're only chatting with this particular PDF. And we have a button to trigger the PDF upsert API call. So our Flowwise chat flow can work its magic to upsert this PDF file into our vector database. And uh, so the upload file, we're going to attach the store file for store file for upload action here. And the upload type will be local upload and the file type is PDF. And we're going to show snack bar just so users know when the, the upload hasn't complete yet. And the name is, is aut automatically there. Um, but this is going to be used to refer to if you, it's more useful when you have multiple upload actions on the same page, but for, for, for us, it doesn't really matter. So you don't have to worry about that. And you can click on the PDF viewer widget and for the uploaded. So the PDF source will be uploaded file. And then we can map the uploaded file into here. So, Every time a user upload a file locally, it will just show up here on the PDF viewer widget. And then let's talk about our action chain for the start asking button to trigger our PDF upsert API call for Flowwise chat flow so that we can upsert the uploaded PDF into our super base. We're going to do a backend API call. We're going to do the group Flowwise and we're going to do the PDF upsert call. And for the two variables, we can add two variables um, are the variables we set up previously. We will map our files to our uploaded local file. And for the metadata, we need to do a text combination because as we have discussed previously, technically we need a JSON type here, but due to the constraint, we are using a string type. Hence, we need to use text combination to recreate this JSON structure for Flowwise to recognize and use. The te text combination is as shown here. So basically, the first text is this namespace part. And for the text two, we basically gonna dynamically put, you know, absurd namespace, which is the name of this PDF. And we're gonna do it underscore and then we're going to plug our users authentic authenticated users user ID here. So the reason why we want to complicate, we, we want to make such a long namespace is because if we don't add 
the user ID part here, we only use our the name of, for this PDF as a namespace. It's not as robust because users can actually name their PDF the same name, right? So if we don't do these uh, user ID after the underscore, once multiple users make the same name, there's no way for us to tell which PDF belongs to which. But when later on, when the user make the query call, we're actually retrieving all the PDF that's named the same name, but some of the information might not even belong to the user who asked the question. So the, so, so the answers are not accurate to the users. And also they might be able to see other people's data, which is not great, right? So if we connect users and uh, the, the way user name the PDF, so the value that the user give to the PDF naming, and we do the underscore and then we connect that with user's unique ID. That will make sure our filter is very robust. We're actually only retrieving information that's user specific and that's very, and that's specific to this particular document that's uploaded by this particular user. So this is the reason why we, are, it looks a bit more complicated, but that's the reason why we named the namespace this way. And we can click confirm here. And after we add the last part, basically to close off the JSON uh, structure, and we can click confirm. Okay, move on. So if usually once you add an API call, usually the, you, you have an action here. Um, but if for some reason it didn't show up for you, just add a condition, conditional action here. So basically if the API was successful, we'll create a new chat session document Make sure to reference the user, add a date created, and more importantly, store the same metadata JSON. So we're gonna put, put that into here as the query namespace, so that you can use the same query namespace as a, as a variable later for our universal query API. This is important because without this variable acting as a filter for our universal query API, Flowwise will actually just generate responses based on all the data in our superbase, which is not what the user want, and it is a privacy concern. So note that we have set up an action output variable name, created session PDF. This output will be used for the subsequent action where we navigate to our chat page with the newly created set chat session document reference as the page parameter called session ref. So this page parameter makes sure that when we go to that page, we know what messages to load. And within that page, when we do the API call, we know what the query to use when asking questions to our knowledge base. So this is very important. If you are, if you are new to Flutterflow and you're still very confused with this part, uh, go to my Discord channel and ask me more. But to simply put, this is a way for us to tell what information to load on the chat page. Without this reference, we don't know what chat session the user is currently in. We don't know what messages to load in the chat page. Also, when we make that API call, there is no way for us to specify the, the filter when we ask information from the super base. Now, okay, let's go to our web absurd page. So let's set up our page where you have a text input field for website URL. And we always wanna start that with HTTPS. Then we have a button to trigger the web absurd API call. And let's set up our action chain for the analyze website button here. So the two variables are URL, which will just map that uh, to the URL text input field value. And for the namespace, uh, we'll simply just do a text combination. Uh, the first part is the, the URL, and the second part is the underscore, and then the third part is the user's reference ID. Okay, now if the API is successful, we'll create a new chat session document, make sure to reference the user, at a date created, and more importantly, store the metadata JSON as the query namespace so that you can use the same query namespace as a variable later for our universal query API. So note that we have set up the action output variable name, create a session here. This output will be used again. It's this, again, it's the same as the previous action chain. This output will be used for the subsequent action where we can navigate to our chat page with the newly created chat session document reference as the page parameter 
which is called session ref. Now let's move on to the chat page and let's see how the, these pages set up and how we actually trigger our universal query API to retrieve information and receive a generated response from ChatGPT. Okay, let's talk about how our page is set up first. So we have a list of Flowwise message documents. Here, this is the list and we did a backend query here. And the collection we queried is Flowwise message documents. And we're actually filtering that by the linked session ref so that we're only showing messages that belong to this particular chat session. And also we added a kind of like a safety net as well. We want to make sure that messages are created by the authenticated user. The list will be sorted by the time created where the bottom of the list is the latest message. And on this widget, we actually reversed um, the list so that is actually appearing from, uh, so the newest is actually appearing from the bottom. And we have an input text field to, to, for the user to put their questions in. And we have a button to send the questions along with metadata filter. And for the action chain on this button, We'll make, we'll first make a backend call to create a new Flowwise message document and populate all the fields accordingly. Make sure it's user is true since we want to display messages sent by the user differently in the message list in terms of styling. So we can, we can identify which are users question, which are the response that sent that are sent back to us from the API call. So we want to first create these and then make an universal API call the two variables we will map are first the question which is mapped to the text field value second the namespace which is the query namespace field value from the current chat sessions document note you will need to use the session ref page parameter for uh, for a document from reference backend query first on the parent widget of this button so you can get access to these particular field value. So what we have here is actually, if you see that here on the parent element, I've done a document from reference query and I use the session ref page parameter to actually get the, this particular um, chat session document so that when we make this API call, we can use the query namespace field value here uh, as part of the API call. And if the API call was successful, we first reset the text field. Uh, the reason why we wait until the API was success successful to reset the field is so that in case the API failed and the user wanna ask again, they don't have to input again because the, the, the text field is not reset. So they can quickly do a second try. We will then create a new Flowwise message document where the message is the API response output, which AKA the answer to user's question generated by uh, Flowwise. Remember to make sure that it, its user field is set to false because now this response is actually not the what user sent, it's uh, the response generated by ChatGPT from Flowwise. And the rest of the fields will be mapped accordingly and should be pretty straightforward. Now our chat page is properly set up if you also want to implement the chat history page where users can re-enter a previous chat session and continue the conversation with a particular PDF or website they have upserted, let's quickly go through how to implement this feature. So for the chat history page, you need a list with backend query to get a list of chat sessions that belong to the authenticated user by using this filter. Then you want to add an on-click action that navigate to the chat page and also pass the current chat session document reference into the chat page parameter session ref. And then when the user click on it, they can just go into the chat page with the right session ref again. And because we have set up our list accordingly before, and it's gonna filter based on this current chat session, and it's gonna filter and it's gonna sort that by the created date of the message, the list of previous messages should also appear and the user can start chatting, resume the conversation with the PDF or the URL they upserted into the knowledge base again. And there you pretty much have it. This, this is end of this course. 
uh, it should be under an hour. Um, but again, it depends on your experience with API Core, with Flowwise and with Flutterflow. If you need more support, join my Discord channel, post questions, I should be responding within 24 hours. Hopefully this crash course has been very helpful. And I know if you haven't used any of these tools, it might be a lot for you to digest in one go, but take your time. It took me a while to figure this whole workflow out as well. Hopefully it will serve as a good starting point, as a good foundation for you to start making your own Langchain app with Flowwise, with Flutterflow, with Superbase and OpenAI. And thank you for watching till the end. Until next time, ciao.